All right, Dorian, take it away. Cool. All righty. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, today is going to be the last, the last day um, for our CATA course, breaking into the tech industry, interview prep, whatever. Um, and yeah, so today we've kind of collected some problems from people. Um, I've asked some of my friends if they um, wanted to, thought any problems were particularly good. And so we'll kind of go over those, right? So <clears throat> here, here are three problems. Uh, the first one is gonna be uh, the course schedule problem. Second one is what I'm calling robots. And then we'll just kind of like end it out, right? Final, final thoughts. Um, so the first problem is, uh, yeah, the course schedule one. And so you're given um, end courses and they're numbered. And <clears throat> some courses may have prerequisites, which will be given as an array of length two, length two arrays, right? Um, so for example, one of them might be BA, or that says that class A is a prerequisite for class B, right? And as these will be numbers instead of letters, but. And so the question is, is it possible to take all the courses, right? Um, so you're given a bunch of these courses and prerequisites. And the question is, can you even take all of them? Can you take all the classes, right? Um, so time is not really a factor here. So um, you don't have to think about that. Um, yeah, it, are, there any, are there any questions? We'll see an example in a second, but. Are these all integers? Um, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they'll, they'll be integers, yep. Alrighty. Um, yeah, so here's an example. So I say, so I'm, I'm basically modeling the prerequisite using an arrow. So we're saying that math 212 is a prerequisite for math 230, which is a prerequisite for CS 230. And CS 201 is also a prerequisite for CS 230. And then we have CS 330 and CS 230 is a prerequisite for that class, right? So very familiar. Um, <clears throat> although I don't know if this is true actually. But so in this example, it's clear that we can take all the classes, right? This is maybe a sequence that uh, some of you have actually done, right? Um, <clears throat> and so there's nothing, there's nothing really strange about this uh, progression of prerequisites, right? Um, so in this example, yes, you can take all of the classes, right? Um, yeah, so I guess like, We'll start with simple observations because um, that's kind of the best way to break the problem down. So um, the first question we should ask ourselves is, okay, when when are you actually able to take a class? Um, or when is it actually feasible to take a particular class? Um, so any any ideas? I mean, just when you're not taking any other classes, right? Um, yeah, so there's there's like no time issue here. So you don't really need to think about like, um, you can you can essentially take as many classes as you want at any given moment, right? The question is just like, is it possible to like given infinite time, can you take all of the classes? If you've like taken the prerequisite before. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? If yeah, so one situation is if you've uh, taken the all the prerequisites for this particular class, and um, what's what's another like very simple scenario? If there's no prerequisites, then you can take. Yeah, exactly right. If there are no prerequisites, then the class is also fair game, right? So we fit it. We fit it all. Yeah. So if it doesn't have any prereqs, and if you've already taken all the prereqs, right? Uh, so already. I'm going to say that we're off to actually a really good start and um, to this problem. So now the next question is, when is it not possible to take all the courses, right? Um, so this is a little bit more nuanced and you kind of have to imagine a scenario <clears throat> um, in which it would be, it would not be possible to take all the courses, right? Like there's something that's actually, there's something that's preventing you from taking everything, right? So what could that possibly be? So this would be like if a prerequisite is not available. I think. 
Yes, yeah, so you said uh, prerequisite is not available. Yeah, what do you mean by that? So like, if Let's there's a class that requires, sorry for Will in the background. Oh. If there's a class that requires a prerequisite that's not available, and so you can't um, fulfill that prerequisite, then you won't be able to ever take. Yeah, yeah, so I guess like, um, I think like a, another way to word what you're saying is, um, it's kind of, it's kind of hard, kind of hard to word, but um, like the idea is like if some class is a prerequisite of a prerequisite for this class, right? <clears throat> now that's also just a bunch of words. So here, here's like the example scenario, right? So math 212 is a prerequisite for math 230, um, but also suddenly math 371 is a prereq for math 230, but CS 330 is a prereq for math 371. And CS230 is a prerequisite for CS330, but Math230 is a prerequisite for CS230, right? So we can't take Math230 without taking 371, but then we have to take 330, and then we have to take CS230, and then we also have to take Math230, right? <clears throat> so this is kind of like the scenario where we're literally not able to take any of these classes because like they're prereqs of each other, basically. And so <clears throat> um, if we think about this, this is actually like, this could potentially be a huge issue if uh, departments don't communicate with each other, right? Like if they start arbitrarily assigning prereqs from other departments, this could actually <clears throat> become a problem where students aren't able to take any of their classes, right? Because they're all prereqs of each other, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I think this is pretty applicable, maybe. Um, okay, so now here's like the algorithm step, right? So we're trying to reduce this problem to something that's tangible, right? So at the moment, we only have uh, an array of prereqs, right? Prereq relationships, and it's kind of hard to work with. So we're kind of, the goal is to reduce this somehow to something that we're comfortable with, right? Um, either like a greedy algorithm technique or like something, something that we've seen before that maybe we can kind of apply here. Uh, yeah, so any, any ideas? Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe maybe you've kind of like been thinking thinking to yourself a little bit, um, but we can kind of model this as a directed graph, right? Um, so we can say that courses are vertices and prereqs are directed edges, right? So I kind of like maybe I primed you a little bit by setting up the examples like this in such a way where <clears throat> there are arrows on the points, but um, we can kind of see this as a directed graph, right? Um, but then the question is, okay, like what is the task of the problem now? Um, because it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to encapsulate this notion of um, like prereqs of a prereq, like of a prereq, right? So how do we kind of define this scenario in the directed graph? We would be looking for a cycle. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so cycle detection, um, right? If we can kind of find a cycle in the graph, then that says that we have a, a chain of prereqs that are redundant, or maybe not redundant, but like overlap, and therefore it's it's impossible to take any of the courses. Um, does that make does that does that uh, like line of reasoning make sense? Um, <laughs> Dory, do you want to walk through um, if you had never seen this problem before, how you would go about thinking about how you might solve it? Yeah, so yeah, it's kind of just like through through the observations that we've um, we've made, right? Like the first two things are when we can take a class and when we can't take a class, right? And so um, basically, like having having this sort of example uh, listed out like this, it seems like like the only scenario we we can run into is if we can kind of find a loop of prereqs, right? And <clears throat> And so that's that part is like nicely defined in the graph section. So yeah, so maybe if you're if you're not super familiar with directed graphs, 
um, for graphs, this problem might be a little bit tricky. Um, but this is kind of an idea. I don't know if that helped at all, Nathan. Um, yeah, any, any other questions? All right. Um, Can so you also walk us through really briefly what a directed graph is and how you would apply it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so a directed graph is um, basically, so um, an undirected graph is just a, a set of edges and vertices, right? Um, but a directed graph is um, is a set of vertices, and then you have edge. The edges are directed in the sense that, um, like, you can only go from one vertex to another, right? So, like, Math two twelve goes to Math two thirty, but Math two thirty does not go back to Math two twelve, right? So this, the notion of directedness, um, gives us uh, a very nice way to describe uh, the prerequisite relationship between classes, um, right? OK, um, so yeah, so we're trying to detect a cycle in this graph. Um, and so like the question is, OK, how like how could we possibly perform a cycle detection? This seems like such a very theoretical problem. Um, but I'm going to say that like we can solve this using a lot of like the traditional graph algorithms that uh, we learned in 201, right? So does someone want to offer what one of those one of those algorithms may be? Yep, uh, Justin from the chat hit it. Um, yeah, DFS, right? Um, we can we can try BFS. Um, I think we'll we'll run into issues pretty quickly with um, traversing that. So. Um, a uh, BFS or DFS has these vertices. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so the two options were DFS and BFS, and in this case, DFS is going to be a little bit nicer for us. Um, and then if you've if you've taken like if you've taken a higher level algorithms class, maybe you're familiar with topological sort, um, but but we're not like we're going to avoid that entirely because that's like a little bit more complicated and unnecessary and chances are your interviewer isn't aware of what topological sort is or maybe forgot. Um, yeah, so we're kind of we're left with like DFS or some some traditional traversal right. Um, <clears throat> so let's just recall what DFS looks like on a directed graph right so DFS on a directed graph is just. We iterate over all the vertices, um, check if it's visited already. And if it's not, then we visit its neighbors and then mark this one vertex is visited, right? Um, so this is kind of the framework that we're working with. Um, and then we somehow need to be able to detect whether there is a cycle in this graph, right? Or a loop, right? <clears throat> um, so does anyone have any like very, very simple ideas leveraging the DFS algorithm? Yeah, so I think like one of the simplest ideas that you could come up with is okay, look, we, we already have a visited set, right? And so if we if we see a vertex and we've we've already visited before, then there's a decent chance that we're caught in a cycle, right? So the first idea is that every time we check a course, right, we can just check if it's already been visited, right? If it's in the visited set um, of the DFS algorithm. And then if it is, then maybe there's a cycle, right? And the nice part is that we already have the visited set, right? The visited set basically comes with uh, the DFS algorithm, right? Um, but if we kind of like go back to our example and play with it more, uh, we'll realize that this idea doesn't really work, right? So <clears throat> in this case, like say we start our DFS traversal at 212, right? And then 
we travel down, right? And we don't go from 230 to 201 because it's a directed edge, right? Um, and then when we reach CS330, we finish with this traversal. So we look to another vertex to traverse from. And we start at 201, but then we've already visited 230. So our algorithm would say, oh, there's a cycle. But in this scenario, there is no cycle, right? There's no loop of courses. Um, so we, we've already seen that like this, this simple idea doesn't really work, but it kind of captures something uh, pretty nice about this problem, right? Like this is this is totally the right direction, right? Um, okay. So the second idea is okay. If we just keep if we keep the visited set and persist across all the traversals, then um, that causes an issue, right? So our second idea is okay. Every time we start a new traversal, we just kind of throw out the visited set and create a new one, right? Um, so every time we start our recursive calls, we can just um, create a new visited set that's empty and then start from there, right? And this like this simple change uh, suddenly solves this problem, right? Because now we can visit 201. And then when we go to 230, we've seen we um, it's not been visited yet because we cleared the set and then we can travel nicely and see, and then we can reach 330, right? Um, all right, does someone want to tell me why this is not the right, this is still not the right algorithm, but we're getting closer. Like what kind of a scenario would, would, uh, would this fail? Yeah, so maybe if we kind of think back at like when we when we uh, make a new visited set, right? We make a new visited set every time we finish uh, a full traversal, right? So if we start at 212, then we visit all of its uh, children essentially, and then we clear the visited set, right? So one one situation where this could fail is if um, we have something like this, right? Where <clears throat> we will DFS through 212, 230, 230, 330, and then we'll go to 532, right? But in order to finish the DFS, we have to travel, we have to make sure that we see all the edges, right? So when we go back to 330, we kind of travel along this edge and we see that 532 is has been visited already, right? Um, in that case, our algorithm would return that there's a cycle, but this is not a cycle, right? Um, so it might be like, more relatable if uh, there was an there was like an intermediate course here, and then you kind of had to take two two other courses before being able to take this class. But this is kind of like one of those scenarios, right, where there there are multiple paths um, from higher from these like more basic courses to the more advanced uh, courses, right? Okay, so that's kind of the that's like the issue with. Um, clearing the visited set every single time um, we start a new traversal, right? Um, so, so I, I'm I'm proposing that we're we're actually pretty close to um, figuring out like how we should actually solve the problem. Uh, does Does anyone have any ideas? Like just like a another modification we could make.
Yeah, so like the whole issue is that uh, 532 is kind of in the same subgraph as 330, right? Or it's like, it's in the same section. So there, there are multiple paths to get from 230 to 532. And so that becomes an issue, right? So we kind of want to avoid this scenario where um, like where like we want to be able to take multiple paths to the same course without um, thinking that there's a cycle there, right? Um, so we kind of want to like another way to put this is like after we've after we've visited a vertex and all its children, right? Um, we can forget about that vertex, right? Or we can like we can mark it visited then, and then um, and then there's like no issue, right? We yeah yeah we forget about we just entirely forget about that vertex, and then when we come across it again, we don't remember it, so we don't have to um, like there's no issue there, right? So going back to this example, right? Um, in the blue path for the DFS, we would reach 532. Then since it has no children, right? We would just forget about it. And then we would forget about CS330. And then when we're back at 230, we would say, okay, uh, the other edge I need to check is this edge to 532. And I forgot about it in this class already. So it's not visited, so I can visit this, right? And now we've kind of covered our bases here, right? Um, <clears throat> but so like, what is what is this, right? So we kind of like want to keep track of the vertices in the current path and then um, like remove them when we finish visiting them, right? So does anyone, does anyone know what this sounds like? Or like, is anyone reminded of anything when we describe a problem like this? It sounds to me like a heap, or, like, or more, more, more accurately, like a stack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's basically like the idea, right? There's this kind of, yeah. There's so there's like the DFS post order part where we have the huge stack presence, and then there's like another topic that I feel like is is kind of relevant here. Um, any any ideas? Uh, yeah, so hopefully it kind of smells a little bit like backtracking slash like post order DFS traversal, right? Um, so this is, this is like kind of the theme of this problem. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, so if that connection is not clear, um, you, can, you can always ask. But um, yeah, so we'll keep going. Um, right, so. The unfortunate part is that like we've we've totally trashed the original visited set that we had with DFS, right? Like the standard DFS always uses a visited set that just keeps track of all the vertices we've visited across all the traversals, right? But we've totally gotten rid of that. And instead we've replaced it with a set that's dynamic and it's it only keeps track of the vertices in the current path, right? So I'm saying that we should we should be kind of sad that we got rid of this visited set, right? And so now the billion dollar question is why why should we be sad that there's that we don't have the set anymore? Like what's the what is the loss? I mean, another question is like, why did we have, like, why does DFS have this visited set in the first place? Like, what's the point? What is, what is the point of that visited set? I mean, the point of the visited set was that we could check future entries against past entries, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? There's like a huge, yeah, there's like, yeah, so th the whole issue is like visiting a vertex mul multiple times, right? Like, why, why keep track of a visited, like, why keep track of the visited, right? It's because we want to know when we visited it so that we don't visit it again, right? Um, so here's kind of like 
an example that illustrates that, right? So if we just had the courses lined up, right? And <clears throat> so we have no visited set this time, right? So we would just run DFS from a node and then we would reach the end of the traversal. Then we would just like destroy that, whatever set that we had for the path. And then since we're iterating over, over all the vertices and we have no visited set that persists across the traversals, uh, we end up at this vertex again, and we traverse do this traversal again, right? And then we we eventually come back here, and then we keep going, right? And so uh, this is a, this is like a huge loss to the runtime. It, it could potentially be very bad, right? Um, like very unnecessary cost, right? <clears throat> so what's kind of the takeaway from from like these two points, right? It seems like the strategy we've come up with now is is good. Um, at potentially finding cycles, but um, the unfortunate part is that there's a there's like a runtime loss, right? Um, so maybe kind of like the classic answer is okay. Why can't we have both, right? Um, so we want a visited set that persists across the DFS traversals, right? And then we also want another set that just keeps track of the nodes in the current path, right? The vertices in the current path, and the courses in this current like sequence, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, but so we've kind of dodged this question for like the entire time, but the like we're just given a list of prereqs, right? Or a list of edges. And the question is, how do we even build the graph? Like, how do we even want to represent the graph, right? There are a few questions uh, surrounding this um, that are not immediately clear. Um, so does anyone have any ideas for like a representation we might want to use or like a way to fill in the graph given a list of edges? Yep. Yeah. So uh, from the chat, we have a, the hash map strategy. Yeah. So we can construct a, an adjacency list basically, and then just fill in the hash map that way. And so I think there are like a couple of tricks that you can use uh, when coding that. So we'll kind of come back to that when we show the code for um, that part. Um, but yeah, so that's like essentially the algorithm, right? Is we have this DFS and then we're always keeping track of the courses that are in the current path. And then if we've seen a course in this path again, then that means we know that there is a loop, right? And so we can say that there is a cycle and then the algorithm fails, right? Um, and then we also have this visited set that just makes sure that ensures that we don't um, visit vertices multiple times unnecessarily, right? So we kind of have these two, these two, uh, these two themes, right? So really this, this algorithm is kind of like a modification of um, the original DFS. And so we need to work with that, right? And there's like a little flavor of backtracking. All right, so let's look at like the actual detecting the cycle code. Um, so again, we, we traditionally use like a recursive function for the DFS. Um, and so if uh, the, like the major piece of information we need is whatever course we're currently looking at, right? And then we have the set containing the current path and then the visited set that persists across, right? And so the first thing we do is just check if if we've seen the cycle, right? So if the current path, right, the set of all the uh, courses in this path contains the current course, then we can return true because we found a cycle, right? Um, and the other condition is if if we've already visited this vertex, then we don't need to keep going, right? And the other part is if so, this graph contains key thing just says that okay, if we haven't, if this course has no like has no courses that come after it, um, then we we don't need to 
traverse down this anyways because it has no children, right? So in either case, we can just return prematurely. Um, and then here, this section is the is the backtracking part, right? So when we did backtracking, we we saw this like addition, and then at the very end, we saw the subtraction, right? So we add the current course to the path, and then we have our um, classic uh, variable, like a result variable, and then we just kind of we loop over all the courses um, that this current course is a prereq for. And then we can just call the recursive function on that, right? And if the recursive function returns true, then we can break early and set the, the result to true. And then we just finish off the backtracking portion, right? And then at the very end comes the like post order part, right? Um, so I think this code is like very nicely structured. Um, so we have the base cases at the top, then we have our backtracking portion, right? Um, which looks very similar to, to the things that we've done in the past. And then we have like this post order part, which is just the DFS thing. So we've kind of like married these two algorithm designs into one, into one algorithm, right? And then we can return the result that way. Um, so real quick, does anyone want to have a swing at the runtime or space complexity of, of just this portion of the code? Yeah, so what is what is n? Wait, sorry, you mean like I meant the time complexity would be O of n. Oh yeah, so is n the n is the number of courses or oh um yeah. Yeah, so that's like um yeah, I think that's that's like one that's one part of it, right? Because we have to call this find cycle function on every course, right? Um, so every course gets the find cycle um, call, but then we also have this for loop inside each of the each of the calls, right? And so the the number of times this for loop iterates will add up, right? And so um, now the question is, okay, how like how often do we need to go through, like how many iterations of this for loop are there like in the entire DFS uh, call? And we can always just relate it back to um, like the inputs that we've received, right? So one of the inputs that we got were the number of courses and the other were a list of all the prereqs, right? Yeah, so yeah, so one part is um, like visiting each course. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got it. Um, o of v plus e, right? Um, another way to say that is, yeah. So we have like one part is for every course, and then the other part is for every prereq, right? We have to do this loop, right? Um, and so we'll kind of go over that again at the end. Um, but here, here's like the building the graph portion. Um, so here we're given, or here we have the, the graph at the top, which is just mapping an integer to a list of integers. So this format is called the adjacency list. Um, and then here we can loop through all the prereqs, right? So here are our prereqs. And then basically what we can do is, um, so uh, what hash, hash maps have this nice function that's get or default, right? So it either gets the first argument, or it defaults and returns uh, the second argument, right? So we can either 
get the whatever the prereq one maps to, or we can just create a new a new entry, right? Um, and then we can add we can add that prereq to the list, and then put that um, put that entry back into the into the hash map, right? And then here we just initialize our two sets, and then and then we can we yeah right this is the this is like the DFS part right we iterate over all the courses and then we can just call the find cycle function right and then we return false if the find cycle returns true right so I mean, it takes take a second to kind of work out this dissonance but and we return true if uh, we can take all the classes right. Um, so yeah, I mean, like this is not necessary by all means, but it's kind of uh, saves like a line and a half of code. So <clears throat> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so for the runtime, runtime for this portion, um, anyone wants it? This one may be a little bit easier. We can just ignore ignore this part of the function since we already we already took care of that. Um, before. <clears throat> yeah, so this part's not too bad, right? We just loop over all the prereqs, so it's um, this part is linear in the size of the prereqs, right? And um, so let's just like recap, right? So building the graph is O of E, so E is the number of prereqs. And then post order DFS is O of V plus E. So V is the number of courses, E is the number of prereqs, the space is, so we need to actually hold the graph. And so that's gonna be V plus E. Um, you might need to take a second to kind of understand why this is the case. And then the recursion is uh, of depth O of V, right? And so in total, we have these two, these two runtimes, right? Um, <clears throat> So this is a this is a I like this problem a lot because it combines the two uh, ideas of like backtracking and DFS and then combines them into one uh, interesting algorithm, right? Um, yeah. So the next problem is uh, pretty pretty different from what we just saw. So this is the robots problem. Uh, so <clears throat> you start in the bottom left corner of a room. And the goal is to traverse to the top right corner, right? Um, but it's not that easy because there are evil these evil robots, right? And they have these like dangerous scanning radars. And the question is, okay, is it possible for you to reach the top right corner without getting caught by any of the evil robots, right? Okay, so that's kind of abstract, but um, <clears throat> so this is like the example, right? So we're starting in the bottom left corner. The goal is the star at the top right. And there are a bunch of these evil robots around. And they all have like a scanning radius, right? Or like a radar. And <clears throat> the question is just can we can we reach the top right corner? Right? Is it possible? And so in this example, we can kind of just use our eyes here. And we can see that if the robot like or if we do something like this, and we can get around all the robots and then reach the reach the target right um so this is this is like the problem this is pretty much the problem um but it's kind of important to describe what the inputs are right so so our inputs are we have the width and the height of the room right um <clears throat> and then we're given like an array of these robots right and they have a double x double y and a double for the radius as well, right? So, so the radius can be different for each of the robots, and we're also seeing that the radius can actually intersect with each other, and then it could also um, intersect with the borders, right? Um, and like another note is that um, your volume or area is negligible in the sense that if there's if there's any opening between like two of the uh, radar circles, then we're able to get through them, right? Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, so actually, um, uh, one of my friends and I, we both got this problem in an interview. 
and um, we both thought it was insane. Um, but I thought it would be like kind of interesting to show show you all this problem, right? And so, like the first, I mean, the first thing we have to think about, or the first thing we should think about carefully is like, okay, why is this problem actually so damn hard, right? Um, so anyone want to point point out the obvious here, or make some interesting statements about why why this problem is actually like pretty difficult. Well, let me just ask this as a as a clarifying question. We were given the x and y coordinates and the radii of the robots. So, are they just passed in simply as this array, just x, y, double radius? So we would have to construct our own kind of interpretation of maybe not how this is laid out, but uh, it's not like there's an easy. It's not like an easy. You know, are we within this? this radius of the robot or are we not as we start to traverse the the world yeah exactly you're just you're literally just given the robots straight up so this is kind of all we have at the moment uh unfortunately so yeah so we're already kind of wrestling with the difficulty of the problem with that question right um <clears throat> right so like another like one one kind of unfortunate piece to this is that um, like the position of the robots and the radius radii of the robots are all doubles so there's nothing discrete about them right like the the first thing I thought of was like okay maybe there's some sort of grid traversal type thing we can do to reach reach the end and then we'll be done right um, but they're just randomly placed throughout the room right there's nothing there's nothing nice about the location of the robot there's nothing nice about the actual radii of the robots, right? Um, and so like a little bit more like nuanced reason why this problem is hard is um, like uh, Rohan asked the question, okay, um, like we can kind of query uh, how close we are to a robot as we traverse through the grid, right? Or traverse through the, the, the world, right? Um, like one issue is this is that it's actually impossible to construct a path, right? Because we need to be continuously checking if we're ever in range with a robot, but we're we're walking on a continuous path that changes, right? At like arbitrarily. So constructing a path is actually completely hopeless, right? Um, since this is like a arbitrarily curved line, right? We saw the example was just um, was kind of crazy, right? Um, so there, there's pretty much no hope to actually constructing a path, right? Um, okay, so with that, so now, like, why might we be lucky? Right? Maybe it's a stretch to say that we're actually lucky, but why might we be lucky, especially with respect to the last point? I feel like because it's impossible to construct a path, we know that we're not supposed to do that and so we can just like try to i don't know use the, the information that we're given about the radio uh, the robots to see if like there's like any overlapping spaces that don't allow us to get through to the other end and so like now our entire focus for them is just like constructing like these like radius where this, the robots live and, and their laser points to and just seeing whether or not we can get through. So we don't actually have to think about like, oh, where exactly are we going? Yeah, exactly, right. Okay. Sorry, yeah, but... no, no, that's, that's exactly that's exactly right, right. Um, we, we're, it's impossible to construct a path. So we can totally forget about that line of thinking entirely, right? And we can only think about, okay, what scenarios would it just be impossible to actually reach the other side, right? Um, yeah, so yeah, that's exactly right, right? We don't actually have to construct the path. We can kind of get away with doing something else, right? We can be a little bit smarter about the problem and then we can determine whether it's actually possible to, to reach the other side, right? So that was like, that kind of like took, like reaching that point took the longest. Um, 
especially in like such a high pressure situation. So um, <clears throat> this is like, we're, I think we've, we're already like maybe halfway there. Uh, so can I ask something real quick? Yeah, yeah, go for it. So to clarify, the actual problem itself at the very beginning doesn't say anything about actually finding what a potential avenue would look like. It's more just, is it possible? Or, okay, cool. Yeah, is it possible, right? So and yes or no. Sure. Yeah, so uh, I mean, an, another thing, right, is that like this is one path, right? But I mean, like another path may just differ from this at some random location, right? Like maybe it, like maybe it does a loop here and then goes back to the end, right? So there are actually an infinite number of paths. If there are a path, there are an infinite number of courses we can take that all differ from each other just by some random, like unnecessary distance, right? <clears throat> So yeah, that's another reason why constructing a path is like kind of a waste of our time. Um, yeah, so that's that's why we're lucky. Um, so let's like revisit this example, right? So we were like pretty limited in like the way we were able to traverse around these robots because due to the way they like intersect with each other, right? Um, <clears throat> so let's try to think of like a scenario where it would actually just be impossible to reach the target. Um, I think it would be impossible to reach the target if there were robots where the lasers like overlapped their height or width of this room. Yeah, so yeah, we're pretty much like blocking one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we're getting closer. Um, yeah, so I was just, uh, slow down a little bit there, but yeah. So here's like one scenario where um, we're unable to traverse to the other side, right? Because um, like if we take our normal path, we see that okay, we're blocked, and there's like no other way we can get around these robots, right? Um, so yeah, this is kind of the issue, right? And so now the question is like, when can we not reach the target? And <clears throat> Sophia pretty much summed it up, right? Um, they're like. There are a few different cases and we kind of have to think about them, right? So, um, yeah, what, uh, I guess we already talked about those cases, but um, yeah, so like <clears throat> if there are a sequence of intersecting robots which connect either the top side to either bottom or right side of the room or the left side to the bottom or right side of the room, right? So what does that mean? <clears throat> so basically we can think about it like there's a, a string of robots that intersect with each other that um, connect the left side of the room to the bottom or the or the bottom or the right. And similarly, if we have this scenario as well, right? <clears throat> so these are kind of like the two situations, right? Um, but already we can kind of we can be a little bit fancier, right? Because um, these these two cases are pretty similar, right? In that uh the the domain of the right the, we start from the left and the top and we're trying to go to either the bottom or the right right so <clears throat> like the the really cool idea is okay we can just make these like one section right so we have like the top left portion and then the bottom right portion and we're just trying to see if we can if there's a string of robots that connects one side to the other, right? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so like, I guess the unfortunate part um, to like this round of interviewing is that uh, this is pretty much as far as I got and there wasn't enough, enough time to actually finish the problem. But um, kind of reflecting on that experience, uh, there, I think there are a few ways to solve this that are all pretty similar, right? So. Um, but the first thing you need to do, right, is just implement some sort of distance function to check if the robots um, intersect with each other, right? <clears throat> and then the second thing you need to do is also have some sort of way to check if the robot touches the border, right? Um, so that part uh, we can knock down pretty easily as like our first step. Um, and we have like some brownie points for that. Um, and then like the next question is, okay, where do we go from here? Um, <clears throat> so there, there, there are like a lot of ways you can 
do this, but does anyone have any ideas just like for fun? Are just very high level, very high level ideas about how you might want to approach this problem. <clears throat> I don't have anything like fully fleshed out, but I was thinking like one first step would be to sort the robots by like the the center of, or I guess like where where the robots position. Yeah, yeah, sorting, yeah, sorting is definitely an option here, right? Um, it's kind of unclear like how we should how we should sort the robots, right? Um, maybe that depends on you know how the rest of the algorithm looks like. Um, but so how would we actually kind of like connect the dots of uh, of saying like uh, there's a set of set of robots intersecting robots from the red bar to the green bar. And we kind of like ignore efficiency because there are like some things that we cannot avoid doing. Can you build a graph where you connect all of the touching nodes and then you can iterate through, like all the touching robots and you can iterate through and find which ones start at a wall and end at a wall? Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? We can we can totally construct a graph and then the the like the two two types of walls could be like two nodes and then we could just see if they're connected, right? If there's a path between them, right? That's like, that's a totally, that's like a, a perfect idea, right? Um, another idea I like a lot is, um, all right, yeah, so, yeah, so the first one is, like, build a graph and then run DFS to see if, uh, like, the two walls connect, right? <clears throat> um, another idea I like that is a little bit more, like, maybe slightly more efficient, um, is we can just try to, like, process the robots until we get a connection between, like, a red wall and the green wall, so, this is this feels kind of like a union fine thing, which is like which is super annoying uh, because these are hard to implement. But um, yeah, these are like like some really good ideas. And <clears throat> we're actually not going to go like in depth at all into this, but I just kind of I wanted to bring this problem up for, um, for a few reasons. But like the main reason is um, like just just like make sure to not panic when you're actually in an interview, right? <clears throat> In the face of a very obscure problem, uh, it's very easy to panic and like just kind of call it quits uh, very quickly. But <clears throat> it's important to like keep persevering and you know just like break the break the problem down um, and like hopefully kind of the way I've presented the solutions to like problems in this whole entire course is um, like gives you some intuition to how to approach these problems, right? Um, so yeah, that was pr pretty much like the last thing. So <clears throat> thanks everyone for coming and showing up. Um, we can totally talk about that last problem more if you want to. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, I think one other thing I wanted to say was like, um, like I know interviewing for jobs can be very stressful and there's a lot of pressure and there's, um, you know, it, it feels like we're all kind of in a competition, but like at the end of the day, right, we're all just trying to you know, get jobs at places and then like move on from college. So I just kind of want to just say that it's important that we're all supportive of each other, um, like in this endeavor and we should like help each other when we can. And that's kind of like the motivation that brought me to like developing this course is um, so that people can kind of have access to like this information regularly, right? So yeah. So thanks everyone for coming to the last last Keta course event. Thank you so much, Dorian. This has been incredible. You are an incredible person. And thank you all so much for joining us.